Hello there, good morning. I'm going to close my door real quick, I apologize. <clears throat> okay. How are you guys doing today? I hope you're all doing well. Let me cut this down a little bit more. Um, good morning. We're back with some more Mystery by Moonlight, which is one of the books that the Nancy Drew game Ghost, uh, Ghost Dogs and Moonlight is based off of. Um, I have welcomed uh, any lurkers who might be hanging out. I hope anybody who watches this after the fact is having a great day and uh, enjoys the um, what, what, what we've got today, which is just going to be some light reading. I'm going to go ahead and jump in <clears throat> to chapter 6. I plan to read 5 chapters today, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Um, if anything uh, is wacky with sound, good morning Rhodes, I'm doing pretty good. Um, if anything's wacky in sound, uh, just let me know in chat and I'll try to fix that. Um, and then just a reminder for those of you who haven't watched a read stream of mine, um, I don't interrupt myself in the middle of chapters. So I'll read through a chapter and then that's when I'll catch up on the chat. So feel free to chat and then I'll just catch up when I can. <clears throat> Without further ado. Chapter 6. A Killer Storm. Just before the tree crashed down, Ned pushed Nancy off the dock and onto the sand. The dock creaked and groaned under the tree trunk's weight. A second later, the edge of the dock broke off. That was awfully close, Nancy gasped. She lifted her head. Through torrents of rain, she could see the sky to the north was already brighter. The fast-moving storm was flying out over the lake. Nancy's heart rate slowed and she scrambled to her feet. She let the rain wash off some of the sand of her shoulders. We'd better seek shelter here at the camp, Ned suggested. Here comes Steve now, Nancy pointed across the beach. The camp director was barreling toward them. Yeah, and there's Tiny, Ned groaned. The dog was soaked from the rain and barking furiously, but at the sight of Nancy, Tiny's tail began to wag. At least he's friendly. Steve was shouting something Nancy couldn't quite hear over the wind. Finally, when he was just within earshot, one word reached her. Trespassing! For a moment, Nancy was rendered speechless. Ned charged right up to Steve. Trespassing? Have you lost it, or what? This storm is serious. We should all get inside somewhere till it blows over. Get out of here now, Steve fumed. He was the same height as Ned, but outweighed him by at least a third. Ned? Nancy stepped up and grabbed his arm. Let's go. Ned huffed, but didn't balk at Nancy's suggestion. She steered him toward a path leading onto the woods that fringed the beach near the camp. Not that way! Steve planted himself directly in her way, barring her from the path. He moved surprisingly quickly for a big man. Still clutching Tiny's collar, he said, that's my land for at least a good half acre and you are not welcome on my land. No one connected with that Malone property is. Go back the way you came. He jerked his head toward the water. I don't tolerate trespassers, period. Nancy's blood began to boil. Trespassing? Nancy was incredulous. There's a dangerous storm over the lake and you want us to swim back to our place? I don't care what's going on. So get out of here now or I'll set Tiny on you. Nancy tried not to laugh and then looked at the dog. Apparently Steve's anger had the animal agitated. Besides, they were on the dog's territory. Ned glared at Steve, but Nancy caught his arm. Don't bother with him. Without a backward glance at Steve, she declared coolly, We're going through the woods. I don't care whose woods these are, but I'm not getting back into that water. She walked right around Steve, trying not to wince as the sand gave way to a narrow trail. You'll regret this, he railed after them. Nancy paid him no mind. She kept marching with as much dignity, dignity as she could muster. When they reached a bend in the path, she sagged against Ned. I forgot I had no shoes, she admitted, rubbing her feet. Tell me about it, Ned moaned. But look at it this way, at least the rain is lighter here. And the thunder's pretty far off now, Nancy noticed. At least we don't have to try to run barefoot through the woods. She paused at a trail marker. Arrows in various colors were painted on its side. Nancy's instinct was to go straight, but the path stopped at the marker, branching off to the right and the left. A tangle of rhododendron bushes would have made abandoning a path a challenge, even if Nancy and Ned were wearing shoes. She checked the trails. The one to the right led back down to the lake, though what, through what looked to be a very scrubby, thorny bush. 
The trail on the left climbed up the side of the hill where a low cliff of black rock glistened through the trees. The forest looked deeper here, but the path had less underbrush and was covered with soft pine needles. Nancy figured that campers or staff maintained the trails. I guess we go this way? We could hit Emily's by going up a bit, then cutting over, Ned suggested. Nancy made a face. I can't say I love that idea. She and Robbie seem to have something to work out, so I'd rather not run into them again. But you're right. Let's stick to the path here a while and then cut over. As the trees get bigger, there's less undergrowth, so the going will be easier, even without a path. As they proceeded down the trail, sunlight filtered through the trees, making steam rise from the recently soaked forest floor. Birds sang high overhead, and the leaves were dripping. As she gingerly made her way, Nancy tried to focus on how pretty the forest looked and smelled after a rain, and to forget about her poor feet. Up ahead, a branch creaked. Nancy froze. Did you hear that? She whispered, curious to see what kind of wildlife was rummaging in the brush. Ned nodded. Do you think it's a deer? She whispered again. She took a few cautious steps forward. It's too quiet to be Tiny or Steve, Ned joked. Nancy laughed silently and walked as quietly as she could a little farther up the path. Through the leaves of the trees, she glimpsed something dark crouching down in front of the face of the cliff. It didn't look like a deer. What are you doing here? Ned's voice behind her made the crouching figure jump up. Jim? Nancy couldn't quite believe her eyes. Then she looked from him to the base of the cliff. At first, she didn't notice the shallow cave. A low cairn of rocks was arranged at the mouth of the cave. Jim was holding something in his hand, but Nancy couldn't quite make out what. As soon as he saw Ned and Nancy, he tossed what he was holding back into the cave and shielded the entrance with his body. Are you clones or what? Ned shook his head. It seems you're the one turning up everywhere today. This is private property. Delmonico doesn't care if I hike in here. Anyway, what, does he know, what he doesn't know won't bother him. What's your excuse? Jim challenged Ned. Nancy touched Ned's arm. Look, she whispered, whatever Jim's up to is his business. If he's looking for a run-in with Delmonico, that's his problem. Let's just get out of here. Nancy was grateful when Ned re agreed readily. Right. Besides, this is where we should cut off to get back to the house. Otherwise, we'll have to tackle the dirt road barefoot, too. Bess greeted them a little while later from the yard. You guys are a sight for sore eyes, even if you do look about as bad as my laundry. She and George were taking a load of soaking wet laundry off the line and throwing it into a basket. Ned and Nancy had stopped to retrieve their flip-flops from the dock. Tell me about it, Nancy said, turning on the garden hose to wash off her feet. They were sore and filthy. Ned stuck out his feet for her to hose down, too. I was worried when the storm came in and you guys weren't back here yet, but I figured you guys would take shelter somewhere, George said. Ned and Nancy exchanged a look. Not exactly, they said in unison, and then began to laugh. Actually, it's a long story, and I'll fill you in on the details later, Nancy said, but first I'm hitting the shower. Then Nancy remembered Bess had told her the night before that the cottage didn't have a dryer, and all those wet clothes. Do you want to run into town for a laundromat? I'll drive you in before dinner and you can pick up a pizza or something. No need, George answered. Since we're going to Emily's to watch a video tonight, I'm pretty sure she'll let us use her dryer. I'll call to check. I'm curious to see what movie Robbie's picked for the occasion, Bess remarked. <clears throat> a couple of hours later, to her dismay, Bess found out. What a guy flick, she grumbled from an oversized chair in Emily's sprawling living room. Ned and Nancy were curled up together on one of the two couches in the room. George was sprawled on the floor in front of the TV. The other couch held Robbie and Emily, with a good three feet and a bowl of popcorn between them. Nancy had been trying to figure out their relationship all night. Had they dated in college, or were they just friends? But at the moment, her eyes were riveted on the oversized TV. The movie was a top-notch Prohibition-era mystery she'd never seen before. Dark waters run red. It's not a guy flick, George corrected Bess. It's just film noir. It's a classic. Shh, Robbie commanded from the couch. Nancy turned and saw he was perched at the edge of his seat, eyes bright and excited as he viewed the screen. She quickly turned back in time to see the action. Heavily armed government agents surrounded a gangster's house. Roaring twenties dance music blared from the house's open windows out onto the driveway. Barely visible on the dimly lit screen were the shiny black sedans parked outside the house. The female lead, a gangster's mall, dressed in a sparkly flapper outfit, strolled onto the porch, a long cigarette holder propped between her fingers. The camera zoomed in on her face. She stared with a bored expression beyond the porch out into the night. Suddenly her face registered pure panic. She screamed and bolted back into the house. 
Guys, she said in a pure Brooklyn accent, we've been busted. With that, pandemonium broke loose and a shootout lit up the screen. The camera panned back and Nancy gasped. Why, that looks just like this Malone house. Ravi whooped with glee. Because it is. And because once upon a time, this place was the real hideaway of the notorious mobster, Mike Malone. That's the end of chapter six. I'm trying to find a good happy medium for this music here. I feel like that's fine. All right, that's chapter six. Let me take a drink of my water. <clears throat> and we will continue forward. Chapter 7, A Secret Revealed Emily jumped up. She stared down at Ravi, who was still on the sofa. Is this some kind of sick joke? Ravi seemed stunned by en Emily's reaction. He stood up slowly. Emily, I can't believe you, of all people, didn't know the history of this place before you bought it. I thought it was beyond cool, considering your work. What work? And what makes you think this place is an old gangster hideout? Nancy asked. George grabbed a remote and stopped the tape. Wasn't it probably just rented out for some location shooting? Of course it was rented out by the movie company long after Mike Malone was carted off to jail. In fact, the film was made long after the valley was flooded, which is how I found out about this. I was researching the lost lands in the area, and a footnote in one of my references mentioned how when they filmed this movie in the 40s, they had to avoid shots that fold the full expanse of the lake. But back in Malone's day, there actually was a small lake here. It was big enough to swim in, I guess, and it was secluded. Made a good place to hang low after some caper. I can't believe this, Emily moaned, sinking back down on the couch. All I knew is this place was called the Old Malone Place. I didn't know Mike Malone had anything to do with it. Ravi shook his head in disbelief. Emily, you've been working on a documentary on Prohibition-era gangsters for, what, two, three years now? You have? Nancy was impressed. Her own interest in solving crimes had made a bit of a hobby out of learning about the exploits of the G-men and how they battled the brazen Chicago mob. At home, she had even, even had a wanted poster of Al Capone. Whenever I have time, Emily said dully, it's a long-term project. I do some and then I wait to get more money together to film and research some more. Robbie looked incredulous. I can't believe this woman. He turned to Nancy. Emily's outline for this project and the first taped segments were part of her senior thesis. It's what won her a position as a stringer for the news channel. Addressing Emily again, he continued, I don't know why you're being so modest about it, but what, so what if it's a long-term project? How could you not know about Mike Malone and his connection to this area? I was concentrating on Chicago area people like Capone. I hadn't hit the East Coast, New York, and Boston mobs yet, Emily said defensively. What's the problem? Ned asked. I think it makes the whole place more interesting. Hey, if this really was some Prohibition era goons getaway, maybe there's some stash, loot stash somewhere. Like stolen jewels? Vess said, suddenly interested. Ned cracked up. I was just joking, Vess. Believe me, back in the 20s when this guy was busted, Ravi said, the feds would have scoured every inch of this place. Nancy nodded in agreement. They've, they'd have been looking for more than jewels and stolen property back then. The G-men would have carted off all the weapons, booze, and the like. It's been years, and this house has surely had several owners since Malone. She questioned Emily with a glance. I imagine so, Emily said tightly. The family I bought it from had it since the 50s. But, George mused, maybe someone else thinks like Bess. Maybe that's why someone tried burgling us today. Bess turned to Emily. That's why you're upset, isn't it? It's hard to live in a place where someone's been murdered. Bess shuddered. Or maybe it's the ghost of Malone's victims that have been haunting us over the past week. Or Malone himself, Ravi said in a deep, spooky voice and then broke into a laugh. Don't joke about things like that. You don't know what you're talking about, Bess said, offended. Enough about ghosts, robbers, loot, and Mike Malone, Nancy declared, getting up. It was obvious Bess was getting carried away with things and Emily looked really upset. It's getting late. Let's grab the laundry from the dryer and head back home, she suggested. Good idea, George said. The girls waved goodbye to Emily and Robbie and headed into the mudroom that ran along the back of the house where the washer and dryer were hooked up. A few minutes later, they were carrying the laundry baskets across the lawn by the beam of Ned's flashlight. 
More storms coming, George noted, gesturing out over the lake. Sheet lighting illuminated the sky, but the storm was too far off to hear the thunder. Or blowing past us, Nancy said, realizing the temperature had dropped a bit. She put down her basket to zip up her pale blue hooded sweatshirt when she caught the movement of something out of the corner of her eye. She was sure she saw a dim light bobbing through the woods between the Fane Cottage and the Lawrence Jones's place. It flickered again for a moment, then was gone. Nancy decided not to mention what she'd seen to the others. She didn't want to scare them. She picked up her basket, but as they approached the cottage, she handed it to Ned. Ned, I've got to get something from the car. I might hang out here a few minutes. Want me along? Ned asked. Nancy shook her head. It'll only be a few minutes, and then I'll be back. Bess will feel safer from ghosts or whatever with you in the house. Ned pecked Nancy on the cheek and handed inside. Nancy went into her car. She propped open the glove compartment and took out a flashlight. She made her way through the brush into the forest. She stopped for a moment and tried to get her bearings. The light she saw had bobbed off to her left and deeper in the forest. Moving as quietly as she could, she aimed her flashlight down at the ground, not wanting to betray her presence to whomever was lurking nearby. Though Nancy had downplayed Bess's fears earlier, she was beginning to suspect Bess was right. Someone was haunting the Malone property, just not a ghost. Someone alive, curious, and on a personal treasure hunt for something he or she believed Malone had, stashed away on his property before he was carted off to jail. George's suggestion that there might still be loot around had seemed pretty ludicrous, but Nancy was beginning to wonder. Still, she thought, why root around in the cottage when the Malone house itself would have certainly made a better hiding place? For all Nancy knew, the cottage might have been built after Malone had gone to jail. She made a mental note to ask Emily if all the buildings on the original property dated from the same era. Nancy also planned to ask if Emily had been the victim of any weird incidents, either burglaries or any kind of harassment. Come to think of it, Steve Delmonico seemed more than capable of trying to either spook Emily into selling her land or just make her life miserable. And then there was Jim. Nancy had almost forgotten about him. He'd been doing something strange in Steve's woods today. Definitely something he didn't want Nancy and Ned to see. Was he digging around looking for something? He was intimate with the land around here and was probably well acquainted with the local legend. Finding unclaimed money or jewelry would be a boon to someone embroiled in legal actions over tribal rights. Suddenly, a shrill shriek pierced through the, through the trees. Nancy froze. That same scream again. It had come from just ahead of her. It came from the same direction where she'd seen that light last. Someone. Some woman was in big trouble. Nancy sprang into action. Sticking to the trail she'd found, she broke into a slow, careful jog. Branches scraped her cheek. She crashed through the brush, not caring who heard her. Suddenly, something caught her ankle. A blinding flash of light shone through the woods. Unable to see, Nancy lost her balance and flew face down into a tangle of thorny berry bushes. It's the end of chapter 7. <clears throat> Chapter 8 Blinded by the Light For a moment, Nancy lay in the bramble, stunned. Then with a low moan, she gingerly freed herself of the thorny branches and got back on her feet. Her eyes were still having trouble regaining any night vision. Though her arms and legs felt bruised and sore, she knew she wasn't hurt. She touched her face, hoping she hadn't scratched herself up too badly. Apparently, when she'd tripped, she'd broken her fall with her arms before hitting the ground. Tripped. One minute Nancy was running, the next she ran straight into something. But what? And what was that light? Nancy wondered, looking around. Gradually, the world around her came into focus. She spotted her flashlight lying in the middle of the path right next to a wire. With sudden insight, Nancy realized what, mu what must have happened. The wire had been connected to some sort of camera flash. This camera setup probably belonged to naturalists. Oh, I really blew it this time, she groaned softly. The wire had broken, but by grabbing one end, Nancy followed it back to where it had been tied around a tree. A little farther down the trail, she saw a small animal carcass dangling from a branch. Nancy recoiled in distaste. It was really gross. Obviously, it was some sort of bait, this time tied up out of easy reach of Tiny or any other passing dog. Nancy couldn't believe her bad luck. As she had run through the woods, she had stumbled across what was surely one of the Lawrence Jones's research setups. Nancy wasn't sure what to do. Whoever had screamed hadn't screamed again, just like the other night. 
But was the person all right? Nancy guessed she'd probably made enough noise by setting off the flash and crashing into the brush that any wrongdoer would be long gone. Meanwhile, Nancy's conscience was pricking her. She had managed to mess up some of the Lawrence Joneses' work. They would be on Bess and George's case for sure now and probably raise trouble when Jen and Jason got home. Suddenly, she heard voices coming toward her. Before Nancy could think about it, she ducked behind a boulder and peered around the edge. We're in luck this time. The sound of Millicent Lawrence's Jones... Lawrence Jones's voice made Nancy cringe. A moment later, a bright flashlight beam illuminated the path. Nancy tried to work up her nerve to show herself to the couple, but before he, she had a chance, Casper dropped to his knees and let out an angry exclamation. Casper, what's wrong? One of those kids tripped the wire. This is a sneaker mark. Either it was that mysterious prowler we've glimpsed before it was that crew from next door horsing around in the woods. Well, we'll get a good picture of whomever it was, that's for sure. So we missed the screech owl again, Millicent said. Screech owl. Nancy's jaw dropped. She'd never heard one before, but she knew from reading that they had an eerie sound that Native Americans often associated with death and the spirit world. Nancy felt both relieved and rather foolish. So it wasn't a woman in danger or one of Bess's ghosts. At least that, that'll put Bess's mind to rest, she thought. I might as well reset the camera now, Casper grumbled. But really, our research here is becoming pretty impossible. Between those kids in the house and that canoe out on the lake at night, if our moonlight boater doesn't cool it soon, he'll spook all the Canada geese away from the inlet beyond the camp, if that other noise doesn't drive them off first. What noise? Nancy wondered. It's as if someone is digging a well somewhere, Millicent said. But why at night? And who? I don't know, but I'm getting sick of it all. This lake's getting overdeveloped, and newcomers have no respect for the wildlife here. Believe me, next year I bet those geese don't stop here. That would be awful, Casper. Millicent said, stooping down to help him reset the wire. It's a major layover on their migration route. Yeah, well, these kids don't care. I thought they'd be gone by now, at least those campers have left for the season. But now there are more kids and more trouble. Nothing I've tried so far has worked. I think the time's come to stop being nice. Nancy couldn't believe her ears. Were these people fanatics or what? It was one thing to tell off a neighbor who was annoying you. It was quite another to plot to scare them. Nancy was tempted to march right up to Casper and say whatever he was planning or what he'd already done, bordered on serious harassment. But Nancy forced herself to calm down. These people were angry, and she didn't want to confront them alone in the woods. She'd made a point of visiting them tomorrow and telling them off. She probably still owed them an explanation for tonight, but they also owed George and Bess some sort of apology for spooking them half to death. She waited until they finished setting up their camera. As soon as they left, they walked quietly back to the cottage, arriving in the backyard just as another thunderstorm broke. She raced up the porch steps, and the back door flew open in her face. It was Ned, looking worried. "'You're okay!' he exclaimed, and then shouted over his shoulder. "'You don't have to call the cops!' "'The cops?' Nancy hurried into the house after Ned. George was just hanging up the phone, and Bess looked petrified. "'Oh, Nan!' Bess cried, relief washing over her face. "'You went to the car, and then seemed to be gone for a long time, and then there was that scream! "'We went out looking for you.' But just as we started into the woods, Bess thought she saw someone sneaking around the side of the house, so we ran back here, George said, but we couldn't see anything. I thought maybe it was time to call the state police, Ned added. I'm so sorry I freaked you guys out, Nancy said with a sigh. Of course they worried something had happened to her. After all, hadn't she herself believed someone was in trouble in the woods? At least you'll be happy to know it wasn't one of your ghosts, Bess. Then what? Ned asked. Then he seemed to take a good look at Nancy for the first time. What happened to you anyway? You look like you took quite a fall. Nancy looked down at her jeans. They were muddy, and her favorite blue sweatshirt was caked with dirt and leaves. Shallow scratches marred the backs of her hands. Yeah, well, thanks to the Lawrence Joneses, I managed to trip and fall into a bramble bush, Nancy said, looking in the cabinets for something to put on her cuts. The more she thought about what happened in the woods, the angrier she got. Here, I'll get it, George said, ducking into the pantry. A moment later, she came back with some antiseptic spray and a couple of bandages. While Nancy washed her hands at the sink, she told her story. Those awful screams are apparently the call of a screech owl, she said. Not half as romantic as ghosts of drowned valley children or Malone's murder victims. Although the Lawrence Joneses are hopping mad. They figured out it was one of us who set off the flash. George Bess and Ned looked quizzical. Nancy laughed. My sneaker prints. It's very muddy and I certainly made a big mess back there. If it's a screech owl, Bess said, sinking down in a chair, no one was getting hurt except you. 
Nothing serious, Nancy said, deciding then and there to keep Casper's comments to herself. She wanted to talk with him herself. Besides, with little sleep the night before, the frantic swim this afternoon and her encounter in the woods, Nancy was exhausted. Look, guys, can we talk more about this in the morning? I'm about ready to fall asleep on my feet, she said, barely able to stifle a yawn. After a quick shower, Nancy crawled into bed with the vague feeling that she'd forgotten to ask Bess and George about something. But the minute her head hit the pillow, she dropped into a deep and dreamless sleep. It seemed just seconds later that Nancy's eyes popped open. Her lids were heavy, and for a moment she couldn't remember where she was. Then she heard the sound of something being moved in the attic above her room. But there is no attic, Nancy thought. George told her that when Bess was complaining about ghosts. Nancy sat bolt upright in bed and looked at her clock. It was past 3 a.m. She'd been asleep for at least four hours. Swinging her legs out of bed, she threw her robe over her pajamas. Quietly, she stood up and listened. Except for the distant hum of the refrigerator cycling on downstairs and the whir of a fan coming from George and Bess's room, the house seemed totally silent. Maybe she'd been dreaming? Or maybe it was just mice in the rafters. But then she heard the noise again. Something sliding across the floor above her head. No mouse ever made that much noise. George had to be wrong. There had to be another level to this house and maybe a crawl space. Nancy grabbed a bedside flashlight then opened the door to her room to investigate. Maybe there was a small trap door at the end of the hall or in the ceiling. She walked past the closed door to George and Bess's room and then past Ned's. The hall was short and ended at the bathroom which was off to the right. She ran the beam of the flashlight around the wall and the ceiling of the hall. No seams. No trap door. Frustrated, Nancy stood quiet a moment. She was sure she had heard something above her head. Maybe access to whatever lay above was through her room? She went back, carefully closed the door, and looked around. There were no closets in the room, only a low chest of drawers and a large old-fashioned wardrobe. As she ran the flashlight beam around the walls, she heard the noise again, coming from right above her bed. Nancy checked the wall behind the dresser first, but found nothing. She turned her attention to the wardrobe. It was heavy, and for a moment she wondered if she should wait until morning and get someone to help her move it. But if someone was prowling around the attic, they'd be long gone by morning. It was obvious that however someone had gotten into the space above her, they hadn't gotten there using her room. She put down her flashlight. Using all her strength, she was able to angle the wardrobe out slightly from the wall. It scraped the floorboards and made a grating sound. The noise overhead stopped. Great, Nancy thought. Nothing like announcing to someone you're looking for them. But moving the wardrobe meant making noise. At least she'd have a chance to see what the prowler was up to. With another push, she angled the wardrobe out a full 90 degrees. She reached for her flashlight and shone it on the wall. At first, she didn't see anything, just the same stained, flowered wallpaper that covered the rest of the guest room. Then as she felt around, her hand touched a latch. She'd found a secret door. End of chapter 8. I'll read two more today. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that host, Timo. How are you doing? <clears throat> Hope you're having a good morning today. <clears throat> okay. Chapter 9. What Lies Above Nancy studied the door a moment. Someone had clearly gone to great lengths to camouflage it. However, time and the settling of the house had done their work. The outline of a door showed clearly behind the wallpaper. When Jen and Jason got around to repapering this room, they would have found the entrance. Nancy pressed her ear to the door but heard nothing. Whoever was skulking around upstairs had left by some other way out. Using her penknife, Nancy cut through the wallpaper along the edges of the door. She tugged at the ring. It was stiff, and Nancy was afraid she might break it. She grabbed a credit card from her bag and worked it between the latch and the door. She tried again. The door groaned open, the hinges stiff and rusty. Nancy had to bend to get through the low door. It opened immediately into a steep staircase. It went up several steps past Nancy's room and ended in a crawl space. It also continued down somewhere into the lower part of the house. Maybe George had been right. Maybe Malone had been able to hide stuff away from the feds before his arrest. A secret staircase leading to a crawl space that subsequent house owners never even knew existed? Because of course it wouldn't have appeared on the plans. Nancy headed up the steps to investigate the crawl space. 
The dust was thick and huge cobwebs festooned the low rafters. The crawl space had a solid floor. Stacked haphazardly in a far corner was an assortment of intriguing suitcases and trunks. Keeping her head low to avoid the beams, Nancy started toward the stack of luggage. Suddenly, a door slammed behind her. She went back down the few steps and sure enough, the door to her room had closed. The wind had probably just blown it shut. Heaving a frustrated sigh, Nancy felt for the latch. There was none. The side of the door had no knob. She threw her weight against the door, but it wouldn't budge. I don't believe this, she exclaimed. At least there was another way out of the crawl space. Aiming her flashlight on the steep, narrow stairs, Nancy started down. She'd found out where the sound staircase emerged. As she neared the bottom, Nancy froze. A light was seeping under the door. Quickly, she flicked off her flashlight. She tried to proceed quietly, but the stairs creaked with every step. She reached the last step and put her hand on the door. Just as she touched it, there was a sudden sound of a bolt being thrown. The light went out, and Nancy found herself trapped. Let me out of here, she shouted, banging on the door. But whoever was on the other side had locked her in on purpose. She stopped banging and pressed her ear to the door, but heard nothing. The prowler had probably already left the house. Nancy went back up the stairs and began to pound on the door to her room. George! Bess! Ned! she yelled. After a few minutes, she heard footsteps racing into her room. She heard a light flick on and a sleepy voice calling her name. Nancy? Bess, look behind the wardrobe, Nancy shouted through the door. I don't believe this, she heard George exclaim. Where'd this door come from? At the moment, it doesn't matter, Nancy told her. Just open it. There's no hand handle on this side. Be careful, it's stiff. I'm opening it now, Ned said. Stand back, Nan. She stepped away from the door and listened to Ned straining to open it. Then after a second, it creaked on its hinges. It flew open, the bright light in the room blinding Nancy as it flooded the dusty staircase. What happened? Ned asked as Nancy stepped into the bedroom. She was mad at whomever locked her in and was without a clue as to who it might have been. She told them quickly about hearing the noises then finding the door. The crazy part was the prowler was still here and locked me in from below. George poked her head into the narrow stairwell. Oh, I see it goes down from here. Let's go check. My thoughts exactly, Nancy said, but first let's make sure we don't get locked up here. Working together, they managed to wedge the wardrobe against the open stairway door so nothing could blow it shut again. Why don't I go downstairs, then when you get to the door, start shouting, and I'll follow your voice and see. we'll see where the staircase leads, Ned suggested. Good thinking, Nancy said. While Bess went with Ned, Nancy and George walked down the steps. My guess, Nancy said, is that this part of the house is near the pantry. When they reached the bottom, they banged on the door. Within seconds, they heard a bolt thrown and a door opened without a single squeak or creak. Someone's oiled these hinges recently, Ned said, as Nancy and George stepped through the door and into the pantry. They probably thought this was the only entrance or exit. Unless you're actually looking for it, you'd miss the door that leads into my room. Even from the staircase side, it sits flush with the wall and has no handles, Nancy pointed out. They wanted to be sure no one heard them coming or going. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Bess. Apparently the noises you were hearing, which were real, were not made by a ghost. I figured that out by now. Bess shivered slightly in her light nightshirt. But I can't say that knowing that someone has been creeping around right above our heads while we sleep makes me feel better. I hear you, George said, then looked around the pantry and frowned. I don't think anyone's taken anything. Whoever it was made a run for it, Ned said. I checked the porch just now. The screen door, which we always latch against the wind, was open. Maybe we should check out the yard, George suggested. Remember Bess thought she saw a prowler earlier, though when we checked there was no one? Right. Nancy had forgotten about that. Had it been the same person she'd fallen into the woods before, trigger triggering the Lawrence Jones' photo setup? Or was it someone else? Nancy shook her head. No point. They're long gone. But let's see what they were looking at upstairs. Ned, I'll need your help. We can carry the stuff I found down here to the kitchen. There's no electricity I could find up there, and there's lots to look through. I could use a chocolate fix, Bess said. We're all awake already. We might as well stay up. I'll make hot chocolate. Soon the four friends were seated in the breakfast nook, sorting through old-fashioned suitcases. I don't believe this stuff, Bess said. I know George said Malone might have stowed loot here, but who'd have thought he would keep such pretty clothes? They weren't his clothes, silly, George teased. Maybe they belonged to his girlfriend, or maybe he was married. She looked up at Nancy. What do we know about this guy anyway? Nancy shrugged. Not much, just what Robbie told us. He was a minor New York mob figure who built a hideaway here in the 20s or earlier, and then he was busted. 
Well, all I know is that they that these were found here in Jen and Jason's house, and they don't look like stolen property. I'm gonna ask Jen if I can keep some of this stuff, Bess said. She jumped up and held a sheer pale green silk shirt up to her face and tried to catch a reflection in the breakfast nook window. They may not be stolen jewels, but this stuff could fetch big bucks from a collector of period clothes. Everything's in such great condition, Bess concluded, carefully folding the shirt and putting it back in the suitcase. I'm sure Jen will let you have most of that stuff. Retro isn't her style, and you are the family's queen of antiques, George teased. Besides, that looked beautiful on you. Nancy knelt beside the open trunk. Something's weird about this, she said. It's filled with mementos, but they're all the kinds of things a woman would keep. Playbills, concert programs, dried flowers, even a couple of old-fashioned dolls, and... She reached into the very bottom of the trunk. A stash of old-fashioned lace tablecloths and other household linens. George raised an eyebrow. That looks like the kind of stuff my great-grandmother had. Everything seems like it's pretty high quality and hardly used. Nancy frowned. Like Bess said, this stuff is probably worth something. But why would Mike Malone build a secret crawl space to house it? It makes no sense. Bess reached for an old-fashioned hardbacked ladies' overnight bag. It was dark blue with a white striped pattern and its leather handle had rotted through. Look at this, she exclaimed with a delighted gasp. All this old-fashioned makeup. Nancy got up and looked into the case Bess was unpacking. A tray full of cosmetics, little powder puffs, hair ornaments, and miscellaneous grooming items were nestled above a lower compartment. Carefully, Bess lifted the tray to reveal a bunch of letters. Nancy knew she'd finally stumbled on something of real interest. Love letters! Bess touched the faded pink ribbon that held half of them together. It had been untied and Nancy carefully picked up the packet. Someone's been looking through these, Nancy declared. And you interrupted, Ned observed. Probably, though I don't know how long this person was upstairs before the noise woke me up. Whoever it was didn't have much time to put this all away and disappear before I found the door. Maybe we'll find a clue as to who lived here, George said. Carefully, Nancy began to look through the letters. The first thing she noticed was that the first few letters were arranged in date order, but the rest seemed to be stacked together randomly. Nancy read the first few letters and looked up, her eyes bright with excitement. At last, there was a clear connection. These are all from Mike Malone to his fiancée, Nellie. He was married? Ned sounded surprised. Apparently, or he planned to be, Nancy said, and the letters are only part love letters. Part of every letter also recounts Malone's exploits with the mob to Nellie. That's pretty dangerous stuff to put in writing, Ned pointed out. If the feds ever found these letters, they would have had enough to put him away for life. Which they did, George reminded him, with or without the letters. I bet Emily would give her right arm to see these. This stuff is a real history of the day-to-day -day workings of bootleggers and hoodlums. Isn't that what Ravi said her long-term documentary was about? Nancy nodded. Yes, Emily would love to see these, and we'll show them to her eventually. She had a pretty bad reaction to hearing Malone was connected with her new home. Who can blame her? Ned laughed. Talk about bringing work home with you. Nancy was only half listening. Using the postmarks, she was carefully putting the letters in order by date. There's a letter here every Tuesday and Thursday for well over two years, except for one gap toward the end of 1925 when two weeks worth of letters are missing. Nancy looked from Bess to George to Ned. Someone's been in here and taken a group of letters. But why? That's the end of chapter nine. One more chapter I'll read today. You already fell back asleep for three hours. I love sleeping. <clears throat> How you guys doing? Hope your morning's been well. chapter let's do it <clears throat> chapter 10 the best laid plans Nancy took a look through the remaining letters I'm just too tired to figure this out right now 
Let's not tell anyone about these letters just yet, not even Emily. I want to do some research first. I'm headed off for a nap. When I wake up, I want to go into town and check out the historical society. In a small community like this, particularly back then, Malone must have been something of a local celebrity. I bet they still have records of his arrest on file. Ned made a face. I thought we might explore the lake with the boats today. George said two canoes come with the cabin, and that Emily has one too. I was going to see if Robbie wanted to join us. Nancy hated to see the disappointment in Ned's eyes. You know I want to spend time with you, but I have to check this out or it's going to drive me crazy. She turned to Bess and George. Why don't you all go without me? It won't be the same, George said. And are you sure you don't want one of us along for the ride? That's okay, I won't be in town long. Anyway, at the moment, I just need a nap. We all do, Bess said with a yawn. But we better lock up down here first. And maybe close that secret door to your room, Nancy. If the Prowler comes back, we don't want him or her traipsing through the crawl space. With that, Nancy went upstairs. But before she went to sleep, she carefully put the packet of letters in her knapsack. Refreshed by a few hours sleep, Nancy showered and was in town before noon. The Lost Valley Historical Society was housed in the same sprawling Victorian mansion as the Native American Museum where Jim worked. She was not in the mood for another run-in with him. It seemed every time they saw each other, something nasty happened, tempers flared, and Nancy ended up fighting mad. With any luck, he wouldn't be around. Nancy climbed up the short flight of steps to the wraparound porch and discovered that the building had been renovated. There were two front doors, one leading to the Historical Society, the other to the Native American Museum. The door to the museum was open, but a sign hung on the doorknob of the Historical Society saying that the Society was closed for lunch and would reopen at one. Nancy checked her watch. She had a 20-minute wait. She wasn't sure what to do. Part of her was eager to visit the museum, but what if she ran into Jim? She hesitated for a minute. She wasn't going to let that guy's nasty attitude stop her from going. Nancy walked through the open door into a spacious foyer lined with display cases. She continued on to a large open room. Along the walls were ancient and contemporary local native crafts, mainly Lenape. But Nancy's attention was quickly drawn to a diorama set up on a huge round table in the center of the room. Posted at the front of the table was a simple sign. It read, Before the Flood. Nancy's curiosity soared when she realized it was a skillfully crafted reproduction of the valley in 1924. Nancy quickly located the North Shore. Sure enough, the diorama was so detailed, she easily located must, what must have been the whole Malone property. As Robbie said, it bordered a large beaver pond. The valley below was a regular patchwork of farms with fields, barns, and farmhouses. Small hamlets with church spires and tiny streets punctuated the sparsely populated landscape. The Malone property bordered what was labeled as Lenape Land. It was a small tract, but it ran right through the current dividing line between Emily's house and Camp Moonlight. And all of Camp Moonlight had originally belonged to the Lenape people. Malone's little compound showed the big house, the guest house, a tool shed, but no boathouse. That's the before picture. Now how about the after? A tight voice commented. Nancy turned. Jim, she said, forcing back a wave of anger. We keep running into each other, he said, folding his arms across his chest. His whole being was a challenge to her, but Nancy decided not to, be a cha to not be challenged. She was too curious about the valley and this diorama. This museum's pretty impressive, she said. As she'd hoped, her comment disarmed him slightly. Well, now, now that I'm permanent staff, we have one full-time curator, then me and two assistants. We're getting things together, slowly but surely, he said, a note of real pride in his voice. When my boss gets back from vacation, I'll be able to wor work full-time on part two of this one. Part two is after the flood? Nancy asked, immediately wanting to bite back her words as she realized Jim thought she was mocking him. Yeah, what else? Jim said, tensing up again. If you're interested, it's in the next room. It's still pretty much a work in progress. Nancy was surprised at his offer and quickly took him up on it. He led her into a room that abutted the historical society's half of the building. A broad, open-arched doorway separated the two institutions. Now this should look more familiar, he said, drawing back a protective cloth from the top of a large display table. The whole north shore of the lake looked pretty complete to Nancy, though the east, west, and south shores were still blocked out with brown terraform material and lots of post-it notes. Nancy quickly spotted the Fane Cottage, Emily's house, Camp Moonlight, and then on the other side of the Fanes, a nearly completed mo model of the Lawrence Jones's cabin. <clears throat> Map locator pins dotted part of the forest, the grounds of Camp Moonlight, the Fane Cottage, and Emily's yard. Some of the pins went right down into the replicated lake. What are these? she asked Jim. 
None of your business? He snapped. Nancy rolled her eyes. This guy kept acting as if she were personally responsible for flooding the valley and disturbing his ancestral lands. What's with you? She started to ask, but just then a woman poked her head through the door to the historical society side of the building. I'm back, Jim. I'm officially open now. You don't need to watch the shop, the woman said. Jim gave her a thumbs up and walked away from Nancy. The whole reason Nancy had come to town was to check out the historical society. Excuse me, but I actually came here to check out some of your records, Nancy said to the woman. Of course, come in. Sorry I was still at lunch, but I hope Jim kept you entertained, the woman said, flicking on the lights in the front room. Before tucking her purse inside her desk, she pulled out her compact and checked her hair. She was an attractive woman with a friendly smile. Nancy decided not to respond to her remark about Jim. My name's Nancy Drew, and I'm staying with friends at the cottage on the old Malone property on the North Shore. Mike Malone's old place? Yes, I know the cottage. It's charming. I hear a young couple bought it about a year or so ago, and then the Malone house itself just got sold after being on the market for a good five years. Amazing when things start happening, they happen fast, she babbled on. Oh, by the way, my name's Karen Kopeski. I w more or less run this place together with a really great committee of volunteers. Nancy smiled. She'd have to talk fast to get a word in edgewise. Karen was such a talker. <clears throat> anyway, Nancy said, zip unzipping her knapsack, I find these letters in the cottage last night. Apparently there's a secret stairway in the house that leads to a... You don't say! Karen looked thrilled. To a crawl space, Nancy continued. I went through the letters a little bit last night. They were all written by Mike Malone, but I wondered if your records here could shed any light on them. Oh my, those would be of great interest to the society, Karen said. Mike Malone is a real local celebrity. In fact, there have been rumors circulating for years that he's still haunting the main old house. Of course, that's only if you believe in ghosts. But if you do, Karen giggled, there are supposedly at least ten of them wandering around the North Shore. Why, the ghosts of farmers who lived 25 miles away down the valley would bother to hunt the North Shore is beyond me. Back in the mid-twenties, it was mainly Native American land. Traveling 25 miles in these parts was quite an excursion. Would you tell me about how the local Native American groups feel about Moonlight Lake now? Nancy asked. Karen shrugged. Mostly just like everyone else. They use it for recreation. Boating, fishing, water sports. There are a few who still resent the way the tribal lands were more or less ripped out from under them by the powers behind the hydroelectric projects. People like Jim. Yes, but at least he's channeled his anger in good directions. He's going through the courts, trying to get property owners on this side of the lake to set aside a small area, a memorial really, to the native people who lived in the region for hundreds of years before the white man came. Nancy wanted to learn more about Jim's project, but she could see that Karen was eagerly eyeing the packet of letters. Can we look at those now? Karen asked, pulling a second chair up to the desk and putting on a pair of reading glasses. Nancy sat down and for a good 20 minutes they poured over the letters. Now this is interesting, Karen said in a serious voice. Back here in 1923, Malone's written something about plans for a boathouse and a chance for ser serious boating coming up. Well, what's wrong with that? Nancy asked. Karen peered at Nancy over her glasses. Well, he doesn't spell it out, Nancy, but I think Malone had foreknowledge of the flooding of the valley. The plans were top secret until late in 1924. The minute they were made public, a huge controversy erupted. But since this was a poor, underpopulated area, the power company and state won easily. Nancy leaned back and thought a moment. Malone was a mobster, notoriously in cahoots with corrupt politicians. He probably had inside knowledge on a lot of things. But what's even more interesting is that he mentions plans. Our town archives have plans dating from the last three, the last years of the 19th century. Come on, let's look and see what we can find. Nancy jumped at the chance. Karen took Nancy into the historical society's library. Plans were sorted in large wooden flat files sorted first by date, then title of property. They searched several years before 1923 and after 1925, but they couldn't find the plans. Karen was visibly disappointed. I so hope to find them. You know Jim's 1924 diorama has no boathouse, but now we have no idea when it was built. A builder would have had to file plans. Malone might not have wanted to tip his hand that he knew about the flooding of the valley ahead of time, Nancy reasoned, and maybe he didn't have to file plans. He certainly had the connections to build a boathouse without the locals objecting. Do you think the plans are still in the house? Karen asked. I don't know. They weren't with the letters. Nancy thought for a moment. Had they been under that pried up plank in the pantry? The space was narrow but long and a tube of rolled up architectural drawings could have easily fit. Karen looked suddenly up past Nancy's shoulder. Jim, how long have you been standing there? She asked pleasantly. Didn't want to interrupt you guys, he said. He had a definite smirk on his face. How much had he heard? I'm heading to lunch now, he said, his voice neutral. 
so if you would just keep an eye on things. Of course, Jim, you just go on ahead. Karen waved him away. As he left the room, Nancy noticed he was wearing the same sheathed knife in his belt and was carrying the same sort of burlap sack over his shoulder that she'd seen in the back of his truck the day before. Nancy drove home, her mind reeling from the wealth of new information. Her first thought was of Jim. How long had, be, had he been eavesdropping? She tried to tell herself she was being paranoid about him. After all, except for his attitude and bad driving habits, he hadn't done anything truly suspicious. Or had he? His reaction to her question about those locator tacks on the post-flood diorama had been pretty extreme. He didn't want her to know whatever they stood for. And that smirk on his face when Karen discovered him listening at the library door... Nancy's gut instinct told her the guy knew something about that boathouse, if not the letters. When Nancy got back to the cottage, Bess, George, and Ned were still out boating with Ravi. After downing a glass of milk and a couple of cookies, Nancy decided to go find Emily and tell her what she found out about the history of the boathouse and the Malone property. As she headed outside, she saw the hauling and excavation truck parked in the driveway. She walked around the various sheds and outbuildings, but she didn't see Emily anywhere. She was probably off with Dale and Kevin supervising some project. Passing the boathouse, Nancy noticed that the door was open. She looked inside. Emily, you there? She called. But a quick look around revealed that the place was empty. Two cups of coffee sat on a workbench. Nancy went over and touched the cups. They were still warm. Strange, she, th she thought. Nancy decided to come back later, but as she started to leave, she caught sight of a plank straddling two sawhorses. Tacked to the plank were some sort of architectural drawings, probably renovation plans. Curious, she went to take a closer look. Up close, she could see that the paper was old, and the plan seemed hand-drawn, much like several of the plans she'd looked at with Karen back at the Historical Society Library. Leaning closer, she saw the architect's signature, and the date in the lower right-hand corner read, September 1923. Nancy couldn't believe her eyes. Was this the plan for the boathouse that Mike Malone had never filed? Suspicion surged up in Nancy's mind, but she took a breath. Emily had every right to these plans. She probably found them in her own house and was using them to guide her renovations. As Nancy studied the plan, something struck her as odd. Little arrows were drawn from the beach of the cottage, from the dock of the main house, and from the lawn down into the water. Other arrows pointed to a corner of the boathouse itself, the part that seemed to have been badly damaged over the years. Nancy had noticed yesterday how the stones along one corner had been pulled out and how that corner of the boathouse was propped up with some type of beam. Nancy looked more closely at all the arrows. They were drawn in ballpoint pen, a kind of pen that didn't exist in 1923. Closer inspection revealed they were carefully traced over faded pencil marks. What did those arrows mean? The thought had barely formed in her mind when suddenly a strong calloused hand gripped her waist hard and shoved her to the ground. As her head struck the corner of the table, Nancy blacked out. That's the end of chapter 10 and the end of what I plan to read today. So thank you guys so much for hanging out. Thank you uh, for those who chatted. Thank you for those who lurked. I appreciate you all being here. Um, thank you for anybody who's watching this after the fact. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back with the third portion probably sometime uh, in the next week or so. Take care, and as always, much love from me to you, and I'll catch you all soon. Bye.